there was a very deliberate point made today that the past is only what the future has brought into the present so that when it's behind us it's a past what happened a few moments ago is past for the Lord broke into our present so as a church we want to say we are asking our people to adhere to the requirements that is requested by the health officials in the world health organizations that have made announcements about the things that we can do to prevent the spreading of this COVID-19 virus. Keep in mind that we don't want to instill a spirit of fear in our people because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of right thinking. And right thinking means we must do the right thing. Okay, so if somebody comes to you in church and you want to greet them by shaking their hand and they don't, please, don't let the spirit of offense enter your heart. Don't be offended. I've made up my mind already from now on how I'm going to greet these Wakanda. <laughs> okay, now, now, the reality is, the reality is, it's not a real thing. But I am saying, symbolically, I see you. I see you, I greet you. But I am also being diligent and vigilant. Uh, around the present pandemic in the world. But I'm not living in fear. Okay? <laughs> I don't live in fear because God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. But at the same time, I must use my mind. So as a church, as a leadership of this church, we are asking our people, let's not go. The world is going ready. So as South Africans, we go this way. We will be on the other side. No. I believe the Lord, the word gave me that, that, that I shared with the church last week. Go with the flow. Go with the flow. Jump into the river and go with the flow. The Lord will keep us. The Lord will protect us. But He will ask us to con contribute to the safety of our community.
Paul says, from Paul, an apostle. Not from men, nor by human agency, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers with me to the churches of Galatia, grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God the Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What a greeting. I greet you then in the name of he who died for you in the name of him who laid it all down so that your sins may be forgiven and he says yeah I'm writing to the churches in Galatia um, you know in the Bible the churches are always known by the region that they're in or in the city that they're in so the church in Macedonia would be the Macedonian church the church in Corinth would be the Corinthian church but the churches in Galatia because Galatia was a region Pretty much like the Western Cape. So you can actually say, if you want to read this letter and you want to translate it into a modern day context, he's not writing to the church in Cape Town. He's writing to churches in the Western Cape. He's saying, to the churches in this region. Because he came from that region and was raised in that region, he studied in that region before his parents sent him down to Jerusalem for his high school or latter years education. He, he understood this region. And when he came there, what happened was he got sick. Before he could minister the gospel, Paul got sick. What an evangelist. What kind of evangelist goes in the name of Jesus and when they arrive there, they can't even preach because they're sick. And Paul writes to this church, he says, when I first came to you, I didn't come there preaching to you and teaching to you. You received me and took care of me first. Isn't it amazing that as believers in Jesus Christ, we have this amazing gospel message, but our bodies still fail us. That Paul raised people from the dead. Paul firstly preached the man to death, then laid hands on him and raised him from the dead. And you know what he did? He went on preaching. So if you fall asleep and you die in your seat, don't worry, I'll come lay hands on you, but I will finish my sermon. Okay? So, he had the power of God. You know, Paul operated in the gifts of the Holy Spirit so powerfully that in one region they thought he was a God. And when he said, I'm not a God, I'm a man like you, they felt that he was therefore being a false God, that he was pretending to be a God. And they stoned him. They stoned him and left him for dead. And then, of course, the Lord came and healed him and he got up and went to another region. So, when you understand the power that Paul had at his uh, availability, that was available to him at that time, he recognized that there was something in him that was weak. And we as believers need to understand, just because we get sick, just because we have our own bodies that fail us, because we, we are human and we live and we are part of this world, and our bodies are getting weaker day by day. But we are the wounded healers. Of Jesus Christ because in our weakness Christ uses our broken vessels to heal others because the healing that comes is the future breaking into the present so that those who are present can see the future because when healing happens in the time when God is present in our midst it's not so that you can get well yes you can be blessed through your healing but the truth of the matter is you're going to get sick again because you're human you're going to be exposed to something else again. I mean, I know people in the church who are sitting here who've been used mightily by God to, to heal people miraculously. Miraculously. And they themselves have been sick. I have gone up for prayer for my asthma since I was 27. I've been, I go up for prayer. Whenever there's a prayer line for healing, I go up. But I'm still taking medication. And if that coronavirus comes to my doorstep, Boy, am I in trouble. But you know what? I can tell you this. God has used these hands to heal people from cancer. I don't, know, I don't know how he does it. You know, a lot of pastors will say there's a theology that if your left hand and your right hand don't know what they're doing, then that hand can do that and that hand can do that and God will get the glory. Listen, man, God will get the glory. You know why God gets the glory? Because I didn't heal them. I put my hands on them. I prayed my simple prayer of faith and I didn't even know what, what to pray. I'm honest with you. 
I've also prayed with people for months. I, I, I walked a journey with them. I went every Thursday. I prayed with them. There was one pastor that I prayed with for more than a year. Every Thursday I would go and visit him. I would lay hands on him. I'd pray the prayer that I prayed for my other friend that God healed. And he died. I don't understand it. I don't understand why God does that. I don't understand. But I do know this. That as a wounded healer, God uses us as broken vessels to bring about the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says to the church in Galatia, that Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, He laid it down so that you can have access to the power of God through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. My words, not Paul's words there. But in the second chapter of Galatians, he says this. I, lo I love the way he puts this. He says, we are Jews by nature. Now, the word there, Jews by nature, the, the correct uh, translation could also be, we are Jews by ethnicity. In other words, I've been raised as a Jew. I was born into a Jewish family. And so, knowing my history, I'm Jewish by nature. I've been raised as a Jew. And so some people go, you know, I was born into a Christian family. I was dedicated when I was a baby. I was baptized when I became a young adult. And I have given my life to Jesus. I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm a tongue-speaking, born-again believer. That is your history. Who are you now? Who is your father now? Do you still believe that who you are is in Jesus Christ? So Paul says this, right into the Galatian church, he says, he says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, knowing this, nevertheless, I'm a Jew by ethnicity. I'm not one of those that I've got to reach. God called me to reach the Gentile nations. I'm not one of them. I'm actually a Jew. I was born a Jew. I'm a zealot. I was raised in the church. I was raised in the temple. I studied under the greatest teacher that ever lived in my generation. I can boast about this, he says. Nevertheless, knowing this, I know that a man cannot be justified by the works of the law. And as a man raised learning the law and doing the law. The law that he's talking about there is the law of Moses. So in the rest of my reading and my rest of my teaching this morning, when I speak about the law, I'm talking about the works of the law or the law of works. Things you have to do in order to be. And Paul says, no one is justified before the Lord by works of the law, by keeping the rules, by observing the Ten Commandments. Because if we're honest with ourselves, the tenth commandment is difficult to keep. Thou shalt not covet. Most of us don't even know what that means. How do we keep a law if we don't even know what it means? A good translation is, you will guard your heart against things, against people, and against attitudes. And against the way that you are treated. Now, it's amazing that the law was given when they became free people. So, to the Jewish people, to the, the Hebrew nation that was brought out of, uh, out of Egypt, they came as slaves. And then they had a history because the way they ended up in Egypt, there was a history to that. They needed to remind themselves of how they got there. It was Joseph and his family that got them there because you know what happened was when they sold their son into slavery, they sold their future into slavery. Now let me just say this. When you sell something that the Lord has given you or you give it away, because you don't think it's important. You're not only giving it away for yourself. You're giving it away for future generations. So when Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, they put in place a sequence of events that would last 430 years. That every child born from that family ended up being slaves. They sold their flesh and blood into slavery. They did it. In the famine that followed the entire family, all 70 of them landed up there. And they were the first 12 tribes of Israel.
And their children were all born into slavery. And I want to just say this to us. When you take a decision, you have got to think of the future consequences of that decision. Uh, that's the only thing I want to take from that because that's not what I want to focus about. They were born into slavery. God uh, rescued them. He saved them from their situation, brought them into freedom. And on their way to being freed, that's when the law was born. You see, because when you're a slave, you don't need laws. You just do as you're told. But when you become a free person, you become a responsible person. So you are free to, therefore, you have the responsibility to. Like, for example, with this coronavirus. We are free to follow the rules or not but we live with the consequences of our decision and that's really how it works and so if you love others if you love others you will do this not for yourself but for them because I vulnerable you may not be and so you could have the virus and this virus could be in your body and you won't even have symptoms because your body has got a natural immunity to it but in carrying it, you cough it out somewhere that somebody more vulnerable than you gets it and they die. Because you had a nonchalant attitude to it, you have actually caused somebody else to die. And so we're not going to live under this fear of this blame culture. What I'm trying to share is when you love others and you live in community, you do for them, not only for yourself. So here's what, what Paul says. I didn't come into this understanding through the works of my faith or the works of the law of Moses, but I came into it through faith in Jesus Christ. Through, in fact, the better translation would be through Christ's faithfulness. I came into a relationship with the Father. You know, your faith that you have in Jesus is something that Jesus gave you. And it's His faithfulness that faith was revealed to you. Even the faith that you have in Jesus, you receive from the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Because if the Holy Spirit doesn't continue to give you that gift of faith, you will stop believing. And faith and belief go hand in hand. And when you stop believing, people who have followed Jesus have stopped following Jesus. I, I wish I can say everybody that has ever baptized there stayed a follower of Jesus. You know what? Getting baptized is a public declaration of your faith. Your living out that declaration is how you live the rest of your life. You can choose not to follow Jesus. And a lot of people don't want to follow Jesus because where Jesus goes, there's no place for you to sleep. Where Jesus goes, there are people with sickness. Where Jesus goes, there are people who have needs. Where Jesus goes, there are people who are not like you. He's always on the move to a new region. And he's always taking you to an uncomfortable place. And he's always taking you with him. What is this thing with Jesus and always taking us where we don't want to go? He said to, he said to Peter, one day they're going to take you where you yourself don't want to go. Speaking, of course, of his death. We believe in Jesus so that we may be justified through his faithfulness. And not by the works of the law. But by the works of the law, no flesh can be justified. Nobody can be justified. Nobody can be saved. Nobody can be delivered by, by, by putting their trust in the law. All the law does is reveal to you how much of a sinner you are. It shows you how you get things wrong. So Abram lived by faith and it pleased God. Moses brought the law because people were set free. And when you are set free, law comes in to give guidance to the way that you must live. But while we're seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, Paul says. Is Christ then a minister of sin? I like the way he puts this question there because just when everybody's thinking, you know, Jesus came to save us, he says, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be the case. May it never be the case. For if I rebuild what I once overcame, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Now listen to this. The context here in Galatians is Paul saying this. Once upon a time in your journey in the Lord, you believed in Jesus. You gave your life to Jesus. You overcame the works of the enemy in your life through Jesus. You didn't do it through keeping the law. You didn't do it through having this wonderful good life. You came to Jesus. He saved you. He put your feet on solid ground and he gave you a life worth living. Now you didn't earn it. It's his grace gift to you. And by grace we are saved. Not through any work that we have done. He says that. But now why would you want to go back to the law? 
Why would you want to now start trusting, following the law? For the law, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. If I die to the law, I can live to the Father. I can live to God. I have been crucified with Christ so that I might live to God. I have been crucified so that it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Now, this is a very confusing passage of scripture for a lot of people. So are we saying then that we are dead and that Christ is alive in us? Yes, in a way we are saying that, but this is what we mean by that. Your body is still alive, but one day what is in you will overcome what is keeping you alive now. And so the life which we now live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ would have died for nothing. If Christ died and you can be saved by keeping the law, then he died for nothing. And then your faith is futile. Romans, when Paul writes to the Romans, he, he says it like this. But what does it say? And he's speaking about Deuteronomy. Again, quoting from the same book that we read from this morning. Deuteronomy 30 verse 14. The word is near you. And in fact, the word is in your mouth and in your heart. The word of God is in your heart and it's in your mouth. That is the word of faith that we have preached. The faith that we preached about to you, it's in you. The Holy Spirit has placed it in you. And in fact, it's right there in your mouth when you proclaim it. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is thus has righteousness and with the mouth one confesses and then has salvation. So the confession that you make of what you believe in your heart is what saves you in Jesus Christ. Now who can earn that? For even what I confess that was in me, that God placed in me, I didn't earn. He gave it to me as a gift. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. You see, he starts off his argument saying, I'm a, I'm a Jew. I'm not like one of them. But now he goes on to say, later in the scriptures, he says, there is no distinction between a Jew and a Greek. A Jew and a Gentile. A man and a woman. It goes further than that. A, a slave and a master. Rich man or a poor man. There's no distinction in the Lord. There's no, for all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. That's again to the Roman church. And he says this to them. For there is no distinction. For the same Lord is Lord of all who richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone, everyone, who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love this scripture. I love this, you know, because you know what? It means you have to call. My job of preaching is easy. I must tell you the truth. I can tell you the truth 10 times. I can tell you the truth 100 times. I can keep telling you the truth week after week after week. But the reality is you must call. The responsibility is you must call. And when you call, everyone who calls is saved. And you know what? It doesn't say there that those who have a little sin or those who have a lot of sin or those who sin are like carnal sins. And, you know, so we categorize sins, you know. In the law, we categorize sin. There's some sins that's easy to forgive. Even when you go to the courts of South Africa, you know, you have a, a fine. With your car, you drove 3,000 in a 120 kilometer zone. Now they find you a million rand. You come there, they say to you, how did you manage that? He said, man, I, I really didn't see the speed, speed signs. Then there's mitigation and they say to you, you know what, we'll halve it. You only pay half a million rand in fine. So, so the, 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 the reality is that the, the magistrate can use his discretion to say, you know, you're a good person. I remember when I got caught talking on my phone in the car. And I must be honest, I must be honest, my son and his friends were in the car when they pulled me over. It was very embarrassing. Especially when the part that says, employment, <laughs> pastor. <laughs> the fine was about 3,000 rand and they confiscated my phone. And then I had to go to the magistrate to request, pay the fine to get my phone back. 
And then when the magistrate said, but why did he fine you 3,000? I said, I don't know, isn't that the norm? You know, he said, he said to me, this is what he said, do you pay tax? I said, yes. He said, do your children go to school? I said, yes. Do you send them to school? Yes. Do you pay school fees? Yes. He says, do you, do you take care of your family? Yes. Do you make sure that they're all taken care of? Yes. He said, well, you're the kind of people that we want as citizens of this country. And he took the fine and he scrapped it and he said, you only need to pay 1,000 of the 3,000 rand. Now, now, I didn't earn that. That was a grace gift. Because in his mind, the fact that I was doing all these things made me a good citizen. Listen, I was a sinner like every other person that was talking on their phone in the car. And by the way, that fine is no different to if I was arrested and they suspect, suspicious, this is, suspected me of murder or, or of, of running over a cat. And it was no, in some people's minds, if I murder a person, then I'm a terrible person. But if I run over a cat, I'm worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, want to, I want you to understand that we as humans, we categorize sin. That's my point here. As, and as absurd as that gets, I'm using the absurdity of it to show you, you can't categorize sin. Sin is sin. And it only takes one hole in the boat to sink the whole boat. So if the hole in your boat is because you don't pay your taxes, it only takes that one hole to sink your boat. If the hole in your boat is that you don't treat your wife properly, that's the hole in your boat. That's your problem. It may not be a problem to another person, but it is a problem for you. Now you know what? If, if we consider all the things that we do that could sink our boat, that could destroy our lives, if we think of all the things that we do, you know, the anger that we display, we, sometimes we don't even know why we're angry. We take it out on our wives, we take it out on our children. But actually it was Kenny that caused you to be so angry. But you take it out on everybody else except the person that caused you to be angry because they offended you or they said something. I don't know what the reason is for why you're angry, but the Lord knows. And often our anger is misdirected. Now, I was guilty of that. And the Holy Spirit convicted me of that. He convicted me of that. And he said, your anger is misdirected. You need to get this to the root of your anger. Because in your anger, you should not be sinning. And so, I want us to understand, God is calling us to live a life. That, that not just a life that we can be proud of, that humanity can be proud of. But to understand, all of what we have, all the living that we do, we're living for God because we're not trusting in the Lord. And the law of Moses can't save us. But Jesus has. And because of what he's done for us, we want to live the life that he has brought us into. A life that points to our Father. Paul says to the Galatians, firstly in, in chapter 3 of that same book in Galatians. You foolish Galatians, you foolish people of the Western Cape. <laughs> see, I'm, I'm, I see what I did there. Who has cast the spell on you? And, and this is important. Paul says, your change of mind on this issue is like witchcraft. It's like somebody bewitched you. Before your eyes, Jesus was vividly portrayed as crucified. The only thing I want to learn from you is this, Paul says. Tell me this, man. He says, you people are now talking about all these new doctrines. You know? What is wrong with you people here in Cape Town, in the mother city? Every time there's a new doctrine on, on something, he says, I want to know this. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law? Or by believing in what you heard? When you believed what you heard, did you not receive the Holy Spirit? Did you not then receive your salvation? Or did you get it because you, 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 you were, were doing all the good things? No, none of us were. Have you suffered all these things that you've had to endure since you came to faith? Have you suffered that for nothing? Or are you now going to go to some new teaching? Indeed, this wasn't for nothing. How could it have been for nothing? And so he, he started off by saying, I greet you and I say peace and grace to you. And then he says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. 
And he says, here we I am, all the saints, we greet you as well. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. You know, we can be separated from one another. We can be living in different places. But you know, when we have the centrality of Jesus living within us, when we have understanding that we didn't earn our salvation, but it was given to us as a grace gift, no matter where we find ourselves in the world, we are connected to our Father and we are connected to one another. And then the grace that lives within us, we can keep extending that to one another. And my prayer for us as we go into this season, of many new challenges is not to lose sight of the thing that we've always held on to, of the truth we've always held on to. Truth is not just a name. Truth is not just a concept. Truth is a person and his name is Jesus. We hold on to the truth of the centrality of the work of Jesus Christ. And so what we have to do, we do. We give our best. We live in our community and we understand because of what Jesus has done for us, our salvation and our place in the kingdom of God is secure through no work of our own. It remains His grace gift.
while I'll give you praise the highest praise All the while I'll give you praise the highest praise All the while I'll give you praise the highest praise All the while I'll give you praise the highest praise I stand Redemption from the ground of sinking sand When I fall I know I fall into your grace All the while I'll give you praise the highest praise All the while I'll give you praise the highest praise For the rock on which I stand Redemption from the ground of sinking sand When I fall I know I fall into your grace All the while I give you praise the highest praise All the while I give you praise the highest praise